Hello everyone and welcome along to Racing Weekly, a podcast and YouTube show brought to you by Odds Checker in association with Bet365. It's the week after the Grand National, reflections on entry, plus we're looking ahead to the Scottish National Meeting at Air. I'm doing so in the company of Tanya Stevenson, who is a regular contributor to the Racing Weekly podcast, and Steve Ryder, who's obviously been in excellent form in the last week or so. Um, Tanya, let's deal with yeah. Aintree first of all. You were on hand. <laughs> yes, I was. Lots of differing opinions about the race, about the meeting, although in fairness, a lot of people are positive about the meeting. What was your view of the three days and of the national? The meeting always produces, that's without a doubt. And it shouldn't really be compared to Cheltenham in the fact that they're completely two different courses. Let's put the national course aside. When you're trying to, you can't really compare the Marmay course with Cheltenham's courses because mm. the Marmay is so tight, but it just gives to produce really exciting finishes, of course, as does Cheltenham. But m you're mixing up the ingredients of horses that you've seen win at Cheltenham. Oh my goodness, I can't wait till they run at Aintree. Uh, coming through at Cheltenham and the ones that have deliberately bypassed Cheltenham because they know that the configuration of Aintree suits them. And then this year we had the further ingredient of what on earth will happen with the Nicky Henderson horses. Yeah. So it certainly did produce. Uh, we could argue that there was a couple of superb finishes like the bowl and the race with Imperium Pass, Langadan and Bob Ollinger that really, where it was positioned in the meeting, really ignited the meeting and made it really, really exciting. But then I'm always going to be biased because Aintree is my favourite meeting and I'm getting very close to holding my bat up to the pavilion for a half century there. So Wow. That's a wow. My parents do tell me, my mother, uh, late mother did and uh, father did say that I was there mid 70s so we're getting very uh, I can't remember the early 70s right. but I certainly remember the latter you know being told off there for <laughs> running <laughs> loose and things. That's an extraordinary record and a surprising one <laughs> yes. if I'm entirely <laughs> yes. honest. Um, yes. Steve the, the national itself yeah. do you think it's the race it should be do you think it still carries all its luster and attraction that it once did? The race isn't the race that we knew 10 years ago but there did need to be changes obviously made to it. I do think we'll look back in time and find that this is going to be a bit of an outlier, I think, with the amount of horses in contention later on. I've seen a lot on social media saying that it's just a regular handicap chase. It isn't. I think the jockeys were very clever and went a slower pace, probably expecting the ground to be worse than what it actually was. And that was kind of a bit of a, a thing for the whole meeting, really. We started on that soft to heavy ground and it did dry up a lot quicker mm. than what I think a lot of people actually then did. I think the jockeys deserve a lot of credit. It wasn't really a standing start, but they were very considerate at the start. They all spread out going towards the first and, and it was a, a race with without many, obviously, um, sort of talking points for, for the worse during mm. the race. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it as a spectacle. I think you are now going to have to have a different horse that will win it. I think you'll find the classier horses to the four. The fact that we had four grade one winners Obviously, in the first four places, I think we'll say a lot going forward. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed the race. Uh, chatting just very briefly mm. before mm. we started this show and saying to Tanya that um, it's kind of like a, the Gold Cup in handicap form, the yeah. Grand National. It seems to be what it's going to mm. be. I mean, obviously, the winner is considered a Gold Cup horse, has yes. been considered a Gold Cup horse. Um, Miller, Miller Endo won one, the Gold one. Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Both uh, Galvin and Delta Work have mm. been at least favourite once, if not mm. more than once, for a gold cup. Um, so that's the quality of horse that you're going to have in the race now. Mm. Um, do we just accept that this is the way that it's going forward and, you know, horses that creep into the bottom of the handicap uh, coming from lesser known stables are going to be a thing of the past? Uh, I wouldn't say that as such. It's the race is what it needs to be, not like what um, haggard old people like me think it should be. <laughs> what do you but think it should be? It, it is what it needs to be now. And um, over the years I've seen it morph in and improve and have lots of alterations. Everyone's focusing on this year. But throughout the years it's had many alterations to get to this stage. And as Steve's put correctly, there was a lot of consideration in, and it was enjoyable to watch. Um, but I don't think, obviously we see how it's panned out and the first four home were all grade one winners. You've also got to remember that three of the first four home potentially were heading to a race that got abandoned. So yeah. had they have run in that race, does that mean subsequently 
uh, we've got to really go into our thoughts and do we think that subsequently when they get to entry do they run the same race yeah. but I was enjoying the fact that ain't that a shame got sixth yeah. late night pass was in contention for a long way but before we discount the likes of the fairy tales of late night pass you could go back and argue that if you went strictly by the stats that that potentially was expected with late night pass yeah. because he didn't have the form that would make him stay. So it actually gave encouragement, I thought, for the fairy tale stories because we've come into the, the race with such strengths yeah. and the bonus for the Galvins and the Manila Indos, not that they realised it at the time, is that they missed out on the cross country. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk more about yeah. the race in depth in just a moment. The last thing I want to ask you both <laughs> is, uh, ITV viewing figures down to 6.1 million mm. peak for the race, although the share of the audience was high. Are we looking at just the fact that racing is suffering and the Grand National is not as popular an event as it once was, and it's as simple as that? I thought there was less buzz around it. My mum normally contacts me and says, oh, who do you fancy for the National? And I'd get a few messages here and there. And I did obviously still get those in the, in the days leading up to it, but they didn't feel like the the buzz on the street where you'd walk around and, and you'd previously walk through town in the morning and you'd hear people mm. talking between themselves and wondering who they fancied for the national. I just mm. didn't really get that this year. I thought there was a couple of really nice parts around, away from the racing to touch on. I thought Ruby Walsh's analysis, particularly using that helicopter footage from the top was absolutely magnificent at Aintree for all three days. And I thought David Maxwell was just brilliant. And if you're going to get anyone to try and advertise the sport, yeah. He is the man. I know he obviously has his critics with his riding style and, and, and his, his style in a finish and everything that way. But him after the race in the interviews, I just think mm. is absolutely yeah. magnificent. The whole thing around, oh, at one fence, I asked him one, two, and then he put in an extra stride. So I whispered in his ear and said, oh, I won't do that again. I'm sorry. I just thought there was a couple of, of elements of the kind of the ITV racing particularly that I really enjoyed. It's almost as if for this year, the, the window on the sport, we sort of pulled the windows close or for, just to get over this year, which we have. And where we normally have things to hang a hook on, like we had Corrick Rambler as a favourite coming back, um, but he didn't end up favourite, but initially building up to the race. We had Kitty's Light, it's a fantastic story, mm. Kitty's Light, who's um, ran absolutely superbly, as you said, David Maxwell, we had late night pass. Well, we didn't probably have an, a, an, enough stories or we didn't really go out there and bang the drum. Um, and that didn't help. But also, with all the changes now, now we've got a base to work on. And now we crack on. Well, yeah. let's, let's use that phrase yes. and yeah. let's crack on. Yeah. Uh, with this week's Racing Recap. So let's go into a bit more detail with the Grand National itself. And Steve, I'll start with you. Iron Maximus is a horse that I think even you pointed out very early on in the season, one of the horses to follow. But I suppose his achievements this season have been quite majestic, even adding, even before the National, but added that into it. What a horse he's been. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, he obviously started off the season winning a grade one novice chase on the last day that he was remaining as a novice. Over two and a half miles. And obviously the form of that looks good with, with Founder 50, obviously what, what he's done since. Um, but he's just a, a fantastic horse. He has his own way of going. Um, I think the softer ground is important to him because he hasn't got the best action in the world and he's definitely got his own jumping technique. And a lot has been made around the Grand National fences and they aren't what they were. Um, and that will have obviously helped him. He's got really good form at Fairy House because he jumps left-handed. And I thought Paul Townend was particularly brilliant at where he positioned him up the rail. Um, he kind of made his mind up and said, well, if you're going to jump left, you're going to jump out the course. So you are going to go straight. Um, and that meant at, at, at fences like the canal turn, he really saved that ground and he had really tight turns. Um, and that helps obviously <laughs> over four and a half miles. The only kind of moment of worry, and I was tracking him through, watching him throughout the race, was he moved out to go round Coco Beach, who was kind of... Um, suffering at that point and he jumped kind of into the back of him that was the only moment's worry with the way that the national fences are now you don't really worry about fallers at the second last and the last mm -hmm. and I thought you're really going to be able to then stay on well at the finish I technically had the unofficial one two 
because right. <laughs> I had Marla Mission as well as Iron Maximus, and obviously he unseated his rider. Yeah. But I think the, the presence of uh, a loose horse really helped Iron Maximus because he can be a bit quirky in his yeah. finish. Um, but he's absolutely sprinted clear, and he is going to be a genuine Gold Cup contender next year, I think. Um, Tarns, what was your take on Iron Maximus and the potential that he has for next season? Enormous, because when you look at it, he's obviously been trained for this race, because when you see that the grade ones he's been competing in, he's been competing obviously against Galapin de Chon, and he's been doing well, and yet his prep is different. Galapin de Chon prep was for March, whereas I am Maximus arguably his prep was for April mm. in this contest and um, I think he's exceeded expectations of Willie as well, the, the way that that acceleration uh, after or approaching the last or the way that Paul was able to position him through the race gives them further excitement mm. now to <laughs> move on from that race and they've got the guide as well with Manila Rindo and Delta work because he was able to manoeuvre and scoot away from them. And they can also measure with Kitty's Light, who's uh, a, a brilliant out and out stayer who just collected staying races last year for fun. And with the prep for Kitty's Light, it's just uh, gives them so much to toy with because we're looking at a horse that in its prep was only beaten, I say only 30 lengths behind Galapin de Champ, but he's aim wasn't to get mm. really close and uh, it was to get his best positioning and the ground may not have been right, the races weren't really right for him and he's taking on grade ones and then he goes into the handicap and says bye everyone and mm. then here I am, I'm ready for March next year. So, um, And then what do you do with Delta Work and Manila Indo and Galvin? Well no doubt they'll all be back and Galvin potentially, who um, I'd supported going into the race, might not have run because there was a statement earlier in the week that if the rain kept falling, that he wouldn't have been participant. So it showed you how the ground was for Galvin mm. suddenly to get into the contest. So, yeah, full speed ahead for Iron Maximus. That does look a horse of just absolutely oozing potential, isn't it? Yeah, obviously we'll talk more about Iron Maximus over the coming months and yeah. uh, leading up to next year's uh, Gold Cup, but more imminently the Bet365 Gold Cup. And Tanya mentioned uh, <laughs> Kitty's Light. He is 6-1 to one to repeat his success in the race last year, and I believe uh, that is the plan according to the Christian Williams team. Just very briefly, last thing we want to talk about on the Grand National, obviously Willie Mullins is now leading the Trainers' Championship in the UK. A, how important is the Trainers' Championship to regular punters? And B, is he going to win it? Yes, I think he will. Uh, I think it's magnificent what he did. I actually ran some figures before I came here. Um, he's had 19 winners from only 124 runners. Um, sort of 2.8 million. Dan Skelton's 111 from 725. Paul Nichols 120 from 503. But even Gordon Elliott's in fifth behind Nicky Henderson. He's had the same number of winners. So 19 winners from 135. So similar sort of strike rate, but he's only collected one and a half million. Mm. So Willie Mullins has somehow, obviously, going, going through uh, Cheltenham and Aintree in particular, been able to win double the amount of prize money. If you break it down to where those 19 winners were for Willie Mullins, five were at Aintree, 12 at Cheltenham, one at Doncaster that was Astro Diamond when she beat Gala Marceau, and the other was at Exeter when Fun 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 won. So he, mm. ha he hasn't come over like Gordon Elliott has and had 10 winners at Perth. Mm. He's just targeted these two spring festivals. I loved it a few years ago when he had all those horses entered at Sandown and we had that big climax towards the end of the season. I know it obviously didn't go the whole way. Paul Nichols had, had the winner and then they pulled out for him through Mag on the day. But I love the Jockeys' Championship to go down to the last day, the Trainers' Championship. I think it's brilliant for the sport. And yeah, I do think Willie Mullins will probably do it. Tanya, do you think he'll win it? Uh, yes, I think he will because obviously he's looking at now scanning. I think to some extent, air might be a little bit of an afterthought, but he's got strong hand anyway. But when you come to Sandown, he's now getting these little chess pieces and yeah. thinking, what's punches down mm. and watch Sandown? Because at pun in these festivals, of course, some races, which we'll go about with uh, when we look back at Aintree itself, he's got three or four runners in each race. He's got now, too many pieces for the board. So the board now, there's a second board at Sandown <laughs> potentially, isn't there? And there's some absolute buttes of a race for yeah. him to pick up the prize money. Um, do, do the um, punters digest it? Yes and no. 
knowing the fact that an individual is a competition, as a the competitive nature of the trainers' championship, but then the realization that what a competitive trainers' championship brings, as Steve says, it brings the wonderful scenarios of those runners coming to air and then subsequently to Sandown. Yeah. Yes, then. <laughs> unconsciously they don't realise they are loving it because you wouldn't have these uh, big names approaching and adding to the Paul Nichols, Nicky Henderson and Dan Skelton runners yeah. you wouldn't have them otherwise if he wasn't in the trainers championship so it all means something in the end yeah I think it does and, I, and yeah. also the last trainer to do it <laughs> for many people yeah. of a certain vintage the greatest <laughs> of all time uh, Vincent O'Brien who did it back in the 50s uh, so Willie Mullins uh, will be following in illustrious footsteps. Let's spin through some of the other racing that we saw over the three days at uh, Aintree um, and go back to Thursday in the manifesto. Uh, Tanya Il était temps, um got his moment in the sun again in, in the UK. Um, he just seems to be an uncomplicated horse, but I thought the race panned out quite oh. nicely for him. It did because we had the adversaries back together again, Ginny's Destiny and Great yeah. Dawning. What would they do this time? This time it was Ginny's Destiny that went out in front. So then you thought, well, well how's Great Dawning going to play the race? And all the while, you had Ilya Tomp into the contest, who'd come into the race, and we still don't really give him the adulation he deserves. He's had ten run in 10 grade ones. He hasn't won them. He's run in 10 grade ones, and he's won a, a, a couple. Uh, just a couple, just blase, <laughs> throw that away. Uh, but yes, it did pan out because the, Ginny's Destiny and Grey Dawning were worrying about one another. When you then go back to L.A. Tom at Cheltenham over the shorter trip, he was under pressure three out, really, really working hard. And yet this contest at Aintree, where he's working hard behind Gaelic Warrior, this is much better because mm. he's come round to uh, Aintree, you come round the cross fence and then he comes to relax. Yes, he was being under pressure, then he relaxed behind Ginny's Destiny and Grey Dawning and then he was already on the case with a couple of go and he then showed his Grade 1 prowess. I don't want to knock Ginny's Destiny or Grey Dawning, both very, very good horses, but they haven't got the back catalogue that yeah. Leo Tomp has in a young career. He's been as well. I think he's been to three Cheltenham festivals already. Yeah. He, he's, yeah, he has got a massive back catalogue. And it's only when you go to the aftertime arms, you think, oh, yeah. my goodness me, how, how did I miss that? But he, he's certainly one to watch out for again over this kind of trip. Yeah, I, I, that's the, <laughs> one of the interesting points I thought about Ilya Tomp. Although he was running in a novice's chase, he's quite a seasoned pro when it comes to competition. Yeah. Yeah, he's all around jumping. Uh, yeah. For some reason, he doesn't jump at Cheltenham. He didn't in the mm. Triumph, the no. Supreme or the Arkle. I don't know whether it was going back up in trip and the slower pace obviously helped with jumping, but he was still detached a bit early. They mm. went a strong pace. Obviously, Ginny's Destiny didn't get an easy lead. He was pestered, yeah. pestered for that lead. I thought it was a good bit of race riding from Paul Town in because um, he closed up and made sure that Harry Skelton couldn't get out on Grey Dawn and, uh, and get much space in there. Um, I don't think it would have mattered, obviously, he, he went away at the finish and, yeah, it was the first of a few significant winners yes. for the meeting for, for Willie Mullins. Indeed. Uh, let's talk about Sir Gino in the juvenile hurdle. Nicky Henderson obviously relieved to see that on the board. Um, were you impressed enough by Sir Gino in beating Cargays? I thought he was workmanlike. The handicappers put him up £7 to 152 so he was quite impressed. Um, he's still obviously a work in progress, I think. You need to remember that Cargay's uh, has kind of ran seven, eight times now, I've heard. Yeah. He's had, had experience in France, and this was Sergino's only fourth run, his third for, for Nicky Henderson. It, it wasn't the strongest pace set. Um, both Cargay's and, and Sergino were, were both keen in the early stages, and I thought Paul Townend's hand was kind of forced to go when he did. I think she's probably going to be better under a, under a, a more patient ride. Um, but yeah, so, so Gino was good. It was obviously nice to see Nicky de Boinville and Nicky Henderson back into the back in the winner's enclosure. I thought Nico actually rode him with huge confidence. Uh, obviously works him at home and knows everything around there. Um, one of the stories around it was Nürburgring getting mm. withdrawn on Vets advice. This is the second time it's happened to the owners. They obviously had it with, um, with Gimme the Beat Boys over in the Breeders' Cup. And it, yeah, I think they were a bit, uh, a bit annoyed at the fact that they were the forced to be a non-runner um, through being lame. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so Gino was good. It's going to be interesting to see 
how far he goes over hurdles next season because they're going to keep him to hurdles and then go go novice chasing the year after. I think is the plan. So where will Nicky Henderson put him in against Constitution Hill? It's going to be interesting to see the campaign in the both horses next season. I heard an interview with Nicky after uh, the weekend. He was talking about. He said, "I know the two mile top class campaign better than anybody else." Obviously. <laughs> <Would> he? Um, <laughs> And then he's talking about the possibility of how you campaign Constitution, assuming they get him back in full working order. But that is also clearly the plan for Sergino. What sort of impact do you think he can make in the champion hurdle class next season? I don't know. He's a little bit behind that at the moment. But then, of course, we don't know how much he was affected for, by being under the cloud. Uh, that wasn't his true performance, if you want to base him back on the run that against Burdett Road. Um, and also you've got to remember whose colours he wears, mm. state man's colours. So yeah. uh, that then gives you another predicament. It, well, it leaves you to maybe pick up, cherry pick, say, fighting fist, because state man won't come over for that. Uh, but you will, well, you'd be very uh, happy, won't you, to have two runners in yeah. the champion hurdle. But they, we want to see a lot more from Sergino, but then when we get on to the Nicky Henderson stay was a hole running at Aintree. We're going to see a little bit more of them at air as well. And they're coming out of this cloud. The most fascinating thing about the race was the markets. Because yes. it's the first Nicky Henderson runner to run at the meeting, wasn't it? And it was beautiful that it was a horse that was so short, or was it? Because it's easy after time now, once again. Well, he, everyone but, said before the race, well, <laughs> if his horse do? was in form, he'd be much shorter than this. <laughs> yeah, well, he'd gone into odds on the afternoon before. And then he'd in the morning, he had so there was the the movement to go odds against, yeah. and then as a lead up to the race itself, and then you saw that as you said, Nico rode it with confidence. That's the only way you can ride, yeah. ride it, can't you? You know, it's yeah. um, so there you go. But I think we'll see. He's gone up seven, but that's obviously with a view to we know how much better he'll be. Steve said he was workmanlike. He was workmanlike, mm. but that's not the Sergino we saw at Cheltenham. So expect so much more improvement. Well, sticking with um, obviously that theme, Nicky Henderson Shishkin missed out at Cheltenham as well. Yes. He came back and he didn't run, I think, as well as they were hoping and expecting. It was a pretty good race, though, the, um, yeah. at the bowl. Jerry Colom, I thought, Tanya, was brave and courageous without being quite as best. Is that a fair description of it? Yes, he made a, a second last, I think it was. When they jumped the second last, he, he sort of landed in a really strange manner in the fact that to get further confidence that, uh, or to make sure the horse seemed to kind of over jump like another jump itself at the last, which then um, made a Hoy Senor come back at it. The horse to take out of that race, oh my goodness me, Corbett's cross. I mean, he's so... I'm surprised he didn't win, to be honest. No, I, I don't mean... understand it. <laughs> he's just probably inexperienced, a stupid thing to say. He's inexperienced within that caliber of uh, yeah. we had six going to the last didn't you oh, second last six horses going to the second last you couldn't wish for more Corbett's cross was on the outside traveling beautifully and then you had the wonderful battle between a hoist in your Jerry Colomb and Corbett's cross was still in there yeah. and yeah I just can't wait for next year because Jerry Colomb had the experience of eight three he'd won the, the mile May the year before he'd been second in the gold cup this year yeah, he, he had a little bit of Gold Cup still on, wearing on him, but Corbett's cross, oh my goodness me, that, uh, I mean, you could tell that I back Corbett's cross, but I wasn't disappointed. I was so yeah. chuffed that it was proved right that it was. Yeah. He's that class. He's that that's, class. That's the He's thing ready. I thought about He's Corbett's cross. He belongs in that yeah. class. Um, what was your take on, on the bowl? Do you think Jerry Colon was at his best or, or mm. near it? No, I thought it was an interesting campaign this year because I thought he thrived on his racing last season yeah. and really improved from run to run. Really so, I thought point, it, yeah. so I thought it was odd that they took, uh, kept him off between Christmas and the Gold Cup. Obviously, ran a career best in, in the Gold Cup and then w w fought hard and showed all his attitude to win this. But I don't think he was at the level, obviously, after that hard race in the Gold Cup. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what he does. He, he can still improve jumping-wise. He never makes mistakes but he's just not fast away from the fence afterwards. Uh, Corbett's cross, again, could jump with more fluency, look the winner two out, and then kind of probably the, the amount of um, energy used to be able to get into that position probably told later on. Oh, a hoist and you nearly broke my heart. I, mm. I backed him for the three-mile handicap chase on the Saturday at 12 to 1. 
because he was entered in that yeah. as well as the bowl. And they were umming and ah in between where he'd go at that stage. He was off 158. The handicappers put him up 11 to 169 <laughs> today. So it would have been an absolute certainty for that. But it was great to see him back at form. Just absolutely loves Aintree. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what, what, really, um, what J.P. McManus does with his, with his horses sure. next year in the Gold Cup, oh. isn't it? Because we'll come on to, I know the way you're thinking later on, and Corbett's Cross, Fact to File, Iron Maximus. It's, it's some Gold Cup squad. It, it, it will be. He's got a lot of horses for next <laughs> season. There's only one that's the best, though. We all know who that is. <laughs> um, the Aintree Hurdle. Uh, first of all, Johnny Ward, well done. Um, he was pretty confident about Impera Pass, and that was his nap from last week. Um, but it wasn't entirely straightforward for Impera Pass for a number of reasons. The stewards' inquiry, the way the race unfolded, etc. Let's deal with the performance, first of all, from Impera Pass. Yeah, I don't think it went ideally for him. Kind of Marne's Glory and, and Marie's Rock went so far ahead that they kind of just left him alone. So he was kind of trapping the me and lion on the inside and he was keen. He's done that in his past. And he never finds a lot when he actually gets to the front. But it was good to see him back to something like his Cheltenham form from last season because we hadn't really seen that so far. If you look back in hindsight, his second behind um, Tiapu in the, in the Hatton's Grace was a good run and then was, was entitled to, do, to finish second behind State Man. Obviously, the changing tactics didn't work on the, on the subsequent race. But I, I thought it was a nice performance. I thought, if anything, he was idling at the finish. And he had the pace and the way that he races wouldn't put me off coming back to two miles next season if they go over fences. He, he looks the ideal candidate for the Arkle yeah. for me for next season rather than being a Turner's horse. If you look through Willie Mullins' contenders for the Arkle next season, depending on what they do with Ballyburn, who I think they're inclined to stay over hurdles with, he'd be a leading contender mm. for the Arkle next season. He's 14 to 1 with Better 365 for the Arkle. Um, but I, I thought it was a really, really good race. So we'll come into the stewards afterwards. Yeah. But I thought it was, a, it was obviously a career best from Langer Dan. Um, he's up nine pounds to 160, so he'll have to run about 30 times to get back down to that mark for the Coral <laughs> Cup for the third time. Um, and Bob Ollinger, I thought, ran well, travelled well into the race. I don't think he was inconvenienced as much as other people. Um, I think in Parapass was probably clear of him when he jumped right-handed, and he was just beaten by a better horse on the day. I'm glad I wasn't on the show last week because I would have taken on Johnny Ward with Bob Ollinger and I'd have been furious sitting here now giving him credit uh, whilst having backed Bob Ollinger and, and just finished. Well, I thought on the line he might have actually won it, but um, let's move into the stewards' inquiry. Yeah. Tans, and you can kick us off. Did they come to the right decision on the day? I thought they, I'm going to be um, sort of uh, polarising opinion here. I think they did. Um, in the fact that you've had, you've got so many views and angles now, and you, we could sit around this table and spend the whole day arguing and putting arrows to incidents happening from the second last, but more importantly, after the last where they uh, the manoeuvre were in here and past kind of weaved to the standside rail, but that was probably his temperament. You had the little tenacity of Langer Dan, who sort of manoeuvred to avoid that weave in pair and pass, but in doing so, then ricocheted slightly into Bob Ollinger. And then you see the head-ons, and there's bumping all the way. Uh, it's just an impossible argument, and I think that they did that. You're smiling because there'll be people that back yeah. Bob Ollinger well. that said that they ought to get it and perhaps they're right. There'll be the Langer Dan supporters that think, goodness me, um, we should have had a chance because we were squeezed and buffeted like a, a ball bearing in a pinball machine. And then the impairing pass who doesn't want to be in front too yeah. much. And it's just, well, I, it was I, a great, it's a great debate because you have the, the drone shot, you have the side on shot, you have the head on shot and you could start for two out. You can listen yeah. to the jockeys. It's a great debate. Well, I wanted obviously Bob Ollinger to get, get it, it, but I wasn't convinced that he would. I, yeah. And even after the result, I didn't see it and think to myself, that's an injustice. Bob Ollinger should have got it. I didn't feel that at all in any way. So I backed in Perry Pass, and personally, I thought Langer Dan probably should have got the race. This takes us back three years to the Bet365 Gold Cup, where Enrillo went left across Kitty's Light, and they, hand, they, they reversed that. But because Potterman had finished second, second. Yeah. 
Enrilo was demoted to third and Potterman got the race, even though he wasn't in any sort of... And, and I felt a bit like if Langerdam would have finished second, he would have been a re rewarded this race. So do we need to change the, the, the whole makeup of a steward's inquiry where you could upgrade Langerdam to, to win the race with Bob Ollinger in second and in Pere Pass? Because I think that would have been the fairer result. But I don't think it would have been fair to have Bob Ollinger first, Langer Dan second, and Imperio Pass third. So yeah. whether we need to look at the whole stewards process and, and disqualification, yeah. possibly. Um, because this Bet365 Gold Cup three years ago kind of highlighted the fact that something is wrong with the system yeah. and nothing really got changed around it. Um, in, obviously, in the States, if that happens, that's what they, something similar. They mm. disqualify the horse, obviously. It's... In, in that scenario, you can imagine them definitely doing that because it's far more strict with regards yeah. to infringement. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, we can carry on talking about this and I'm sure at the end of it, there'll be people who agree, disagree. Um, yeah. Quite right too. Yeah. That's, it's, yeah. It was a tough one. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Friday. And already <laughs> we've mentioned this name. I, I know the way you're thinking. I thought he's very impressive. One thing I'd say is I thought Iroko was a little bit inconvenienced by the way the race unfolded. I think he's better than that. Um, there was obviously a very sad postscript to the race. Um, sadly, the, the Lucinda Russell team lost Giovinco uh, after his fall. Uh, condolences and commiserations to them. Um, I know the way you're thinking. How good a horse is that, Tanya? Um, superb, isn't he? He never travelled until... They turn, once again, that cross fence is key. The injection of pace or lack of pace is key when you watch Aintree. Watch a few races mm. back um, from over the years. That is key, particularly in this race. Um, I think he was going embarrassingly well at Cheltenham. <laughs> and I don't think we appreciated what he achieved at Cheltenham. Um, it was so, so good. And then when he came into this race, it was just hard to get your head round. He was what he potentially could do. And the fact, he, it wasn't the um, same way that he performed at Cheltenham. Aintree seemed a bit too speedy for him. And despite him not being suited to the track, he won in spite of that, didn't he? he was, mm. He's that good. And I think his form goes up a grade even further, courtesy of Oroko, who is a, in limbo. At the moment, we still don't know how good Oroko is. We only lauded him and quite rightly after a three-runner race at Warwick and we think oh yeah. we can't wait to see Oroco and then oh uh, Oliver Grunel and Josh Guerrero their heart must have sunk after the fact that oh he's off and we have um, he had two hurried runs um, and then Oroco um, is just he just found this trouble every possible moment yeah. every possible moment um, he's found trouble and he's come through late on and he's backed up, I know, the way you're thinking. So, I mean, we, we don't know his ability mm. other than that Warwick three-runner race and he's going to be good as well, but he's going to need a little more time. But he just then thrusts into, I know your way you're thinking, into superstardom to some extent. It's just we can make, make up ratings, but we're going to find out next season just how good the pair of them are. They go in different yeah. avenues. But, we but they, they both still have enormous potential for next season, haven't they? Yeah. yeah, he was just a bit sticky with his jumping. Yeah. Again, it wasn't really mistakes he was making. He's just novice, which obviously yes. they're entitled to do. Broadway Boy was the same. He, he took a chance at a few and was, was slow at a few. I, I think he can definitely jump better, and uh, he's obviously going to be better than that. Um, but the fact that Broadway Boy and Keante Classico set a strong pace, I think, yes, really helps. helped that finishing yeah. effort for I know where you're thinking. Um, I liked the run of Oroko. Um <laughs> He just never really got involved in the turners at Cheltenham. I think that was just rustiness, obviously yeah. being off all that time. But he was a lot better here. He was outpaced. He does look a three-miler, doesn't he? Mm. Um, looking at it, the handicap is a bit of three to 152. That looks a brilliant mark for the Hennessy, or the old Hennessy. Um, yeah. Next season, that would be an obvious target. Given his pace, um, obviously won the Martin Pipe over two and a half. I'm already mapping out there. They're, they, <laughs> I, I'm thinking to, yeah. Colin Parker, intermediate chase. On to the Hennessy. Yeah. Thank me later, JP. <laughs> and they like uh, Carlisle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oliver Green and Josh yeah. I've been yeah. to a few Carlisles and they've been there. So I'll see you, Rocco, there for the. <laughs> Just mentioned the Gold Cup betting for next year with Bet365. Obviously, Gallopan's 5 to 2 favourite. Factor File, the winner is 4 to 1. <laughs> Jerry Colomb, 12s. I know the way you're thinking, 12s. 
Corbett's Cross 16s, mm. Fast Offso 16s, Grey Dawning 16s, Iron Maximus 16s, Iroko's 40s. I mean, looking at that market, we could be set for an, I mean, I, I hate doing it so far in advance, but <laughs> it could be magnificent next season, couldn't it? it that could staying be, yeah. chasing yeah. category with obviously a dual Gold Cup winner at the top of it, but then some magnificent horses tucked in behind. Then we mentioned your horse, Monty Starr, who's yeah. 20 to one. Yeah. Better get the commentators ready for the different colour caps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they will run. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. If they all get to Cheltenham, they all will run. Uh, he's such a great sportsman in that fact. And yeah. at this stage, I like, I know the way you're thinking, but I know uh, Oroko's- At this stage, you like, I know the way you're thinking, thinking for the 12 yeah. to one. The, the way that they speed up the ladder Oroko, but he probably just needs some yeah. He's only had three chances. Yeah. Well, let's stick with the J.P. McManus yeah. theme yeah. and talk about the top novices hurdle, which took place on Friday. Mystical power. Um, I thought it was a really, really game performance because I thought he was in front sooner than ideal. Yeah, I thought Ruby's analysis on this was brilliant. So Mark Walsh was forced to go because Jack Kennedy wanted to come across on Firefox to get to the rail. So Mark Walsh did need to go sooner than what he wanted to, to be able to hold that position. Um, it obviously confirms the form of the Supreme and how strong that is. The Supreme works out every single year. Um, it just shows that, that you can't underestimate horses based on, on where they've ran. I mean, this horse started off at Ballin Road, went to mm. Galway. Um, and it's unlike them, obviously, being Annie Powers' offspring. You'd think that they'd go to all the big tracks and, and would have obviously the potential at home. But... Yeah, he, he's, he's actually surprised me with how good he has been. I know on our review show with, with Don McLean, I said I think he'd reverse form with, with Slade Steel on better ground at Punchestown. Mm. And Don disagreed with me, but I'd, I, I'd be inclined to, um, yeah, to, to give that again if they were to meet at Punchestown. Yeah, I said after the race, I said the Sire won the derby, the Dan won the champion hurdle. Yes. What are they going to do with him? Willie Mullins was sort of suggesting that he doesn't scream, looking at him, he doesn't scream novice chaser, no. but he no. thinks he could make a chaser, but he doesn't look physically that, that that's what he wants to do. What do you think? No, I think he should stay to hurdles for now. Because uh, always, sometimes there is this, and <laughs> JP's got a few chasers, so we can have a, <laughs> have a little bit of a, um, a play with uh, mystical power, can't we? Um, it's a race anyway that if you looked back, that those that have finished um, well in the Supreme did exceptionally well in this. They mm. didn't, not necessarily winners, not many winners had come on, but those that have finished where Mystical Power had in second had particularly done really well, and so it proved. Um, we were robbed, but we didn't know it then. Mm. We were robbed of Dyser Enos and Gold particularly golden ace but we didn't brutal it's brutal. absolutely brutal absolutely brutal because we won't know we didn't know until saturday how much we were robbed of golden ace uh, but dies at enos as well we would love to see the girls turn up because they would have added an extra superb ingredient take nothing away from mystical power what it achieved here but you'd have loved to have seen how golden ace and dies at enos would have got on Especially when you don't saw do what this to me, Tanya. Sorry, don't do this to me. Uh, I don't want to talk about <laughs> those horses, especially Dysart Enos. Um, yes. What a shame. What um, a shame. She might actually run this week. It's um, be good. She might be running at Cheltenham. I'm not sure. I haven't looked Fergal at it. Fergal get the cakes um, ready. Yes. Another 100 for him this season. Uh, sticking again with the yes. J.P. McManus horses. Um, John Bond won the Melling Chase. Terrific race. And a performance from John Bond that I think a lot of people have long suspected he would provide over the trip of two and a half miles. Is this the future for John Bond? I think Nicky Henderson said after the race that he tried to get Nick Edeboyman to give him encouragement for three miles, but it wasn't, wasn't forthcoming. No, I'd stay here. And I'm going to be wrong because obviously Nicky and <laughs> Nico will know miles more. But we've now seen a battling John Bond a really hardy battling John Bond, certainly one that perhaps wasn't now in hindsight. He, he That's when Nicky was going into the cloud when he took on Elixir de Nuts, and I don't want to really take any away because he jumped badly, John Bond, in that race anyway. 
But once again, we haven't potentially seen the true John Bond because we haven't seen the true Sergino, but what they achieved is just through sheer class. He's won 13 now from 16. He's six grade ones mm. as well. So he is quality. But what we did love was seeing conflated complete, of course. <laughs> and when conflated completes, of course, you really do have to be grade one, uh, A plus, yeah. don't you? Because he has... Rock solid, isn't he? Yeah. He, he, he will take you through... And fair old Protectorat, who has been here, there and everywhere this season and come out with a Ryanair. And a, a, a couple, two out, you thought Protectorat was going to give in. But he sort of kind of kicked on and said, I'll have a bit of this. And they went into the, the last and it, it turned out to a fabulous spectacle. And mm. it just showed you then that John Bond is a hardy character. Right, I'm ready. And that's kind of a John Bond that we hadn't seen before because we were sort of making excuses for him at Cheltenham. We don't make excuses. Yeah. He is a quality performer. Now let him battle and do his thing. Yeah. yeah. Using your Ruby yeah. praise uh, <laughs> a line during the race, what was noticeable was Ruby pointed out how much better he jumped at this two and a half mile pace than he's seen him jump before. Yeah, using race IQ, 4.7 lengths he gained overall in the race uh, with his jumping. He's not... He's got his own way of going over fences and Conflated makes a beautiful shape going over them, particularly helped with his first time cheat piece. He jumped really well. And John Bond's a lot flatter and quicker away from his obstacles, even if he's not foot perfect at him, he's quick away. And that's what that race IQ data really does really well. Um, I thought it was a really interesting race to watch. Pictori didn't get an easy lead. I thought kind of obviously wasn't, wasn't himself on the day. Protector out, it makes you question why he was running over three miles for that long. Um, two and a half miles at a quick pace seems to really suit him. I actually thought this was arguably a better performance than in the Ryanair in defeat. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a really strong race on paper. I think Nicky Henderson's going to look at the, the, the markets and the entries for the races next year. And it wouldn't surprise me if he actually came back to two miles. I, I know he appears to have improved for, for two and a half miles. But if you look at the competition, in the champion chase, he's five to one with better 365 for next year. What price and who do you think is the next UK contender in the champion chase? After John Bond? Yeah. Uh, good question. Edward Stones? Edward Stones, 100 to 1. <laughs> Haddock, wow. Haddock's does over 66 to 1. He's the nearest UK oh. challenger. Wow. So you're going to have races like the Schlur. The Tingle Creek, you imagine oh. Willie's going to bring one over for. But you're going to get a lot of these grade 2 and grade 1 two-mile chases throughout the year that are going to look penalty kicks for John Bond. If you think about the two and a half milers next year in the open division, you're going to have Ginny's Destiny, mm. Protector Rat, Grey Dawn, impossibly, Long Presse, possibly, Stage Star. It looks a lot, a lot deeper division the two and a half miles. Brave Man's Game than the two Brave, miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we can wait for the Ryan for that. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, yeah, obviously it's going to be, it's going to be interesting what Willie Mullins does because in his two milers next season, you're going to have El Fabiolo, you're going to have Gaelic Warrior, whose obviously mm. form has received a huge boost, Energamine and Dino Blue. So he's going to have to split up those. But yeah. I just think Nicky Henderson's going to look at some of those entries when the two milers come around and go, hmm, actually, he'll slot in there nicely. Well, he's four to one favourite for the Ryanair chase, John Bond. Um, but I believe he might be running at Sandown in the celebration chase, which of course he's, he's won before. Um, to be a messer for the trainers championship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just to ruin everybody else's hopes. Um, one more race to look at from the Friday. Dancing City won the Sefton Novices Hurdle, beat uh, the Jukebox Man. Just was pretty professional, pretty impressive. Yeah, if you put the replay on and just watch the closing stages, it looks as if Dancing City's hacked up. Mm. Yeah. But he was under pressure a bit round in the bend and then just popped straight back on the bridle. I mean, he looks a real stayer. Um, Jukebot Man, exactly the same. They're both going to be novice chasing next season. It's yeah. going to be interesting. Um, I'm sure Patrick obviously already has him penciled in for the National Hunt chase, but I think he <laughs> might well prove better than that. Yeah. Um, he's a horse I've really taken to. I was over at the Dublin Racing Festival. He was impressive that day. And when you actually then look back at his form previous to that, you thought, how have we sent him yeah. off 20 to 1 for that? So, yeah, he's a, he's a really nice horse going, going forward. The third Cherry Dam caught my eye with how well she travelled. Obviously, this kind of stayers hurdle market looks to be crying out for new blood you get a lot of these albert bartlett sefton horses that the majority of them go novice chasing yeah. and you never really get new blood until they make a few mistakes over fences and they revert to hurdling um and i know she's a mare but she could be one that could pr progress she, she's not even in any of the stairs hurdles market but okay. the way that she traveled into it should be a massive price just watching the horses in the paddock before the race of jukebox man is 
huge. Absolutely enormous. <laughs> I mean, if there is a horse, he's like the, the old party politics. <laughs> yes, I mean, he's enormous. He's he's built to be a chaser. It's, yeah, um, and perhaps uh, the Cheltenham left its mark in a little way because he went for glory, and your mm. heart bleeds. You know, you just felt oh. Goodness me. Um, Dancing City Strange. I don't think they know what they had with Dancing City because going into the Dublin Racing Festival, he had four runners in that race and he was the outsider of the yeah. four. Um, Predator's Gold was the favourite for the race. He beat Predator's Gold. And then he went to Cheltenham and I thought it didn't run too badly. And it's turned out that Aintree is his, his course. But, yeah, stayers. Yep. Absolute beautiful stayers. And we'll look to them do battle once more. All right, and let's move to Saturday and one performance that <laughs> arguably might have been the best performance, even out, even if you include the Grand National. Um, Brighter Days Ahead was majestic in the manner in which she won the Mersey Novices Hurdle. I slightly question the strength of the form. However, she, is, she showed that day what Gordon Elliott expected to see at Chubb. Wouldn't that be fair, Tans? I was lucky enough to be covering her when she won at Navan. And if you watch that race, it looks as though she joins in mm. before the last. She had expended no energy whatsoever. She glides. Um, she's just beautiful to watch. She's quite a, a, a big sort as well, which mm. helps her. And her. I don't know and will never know what happened at Cheltenham because she travelled so well. And then perhaps what we'll find out is Golden Ace is just Top something yeah. really, really special and it'd be wonderful for Jeremy Scott. We know that she's special, she won at Cheltenham and that's why I'm gutted that we were robbed yeah. of her taking on mystical power. But brighter days ahead, oh my goodness, that was the Navin performance. But as soon as that Navin race was run, Gordon Elliott was uh, extolling all her virtues and saying how fantastic she is and quite rightly so. But after the race, I think um, he was questioned and said, is this the best that you've, best mare you've ever trained? He said, apples, Jade. Uh, so yeah. um, she's very good, but he's obviously acknowledged that she's not yeah. apples, Jade yet. But I mean, we're all it's so excited by that performance. Yes, the race potentially might have fallen apart. The likes of Jimmy Desoy and Ilan T. Ilan Tink wasn't missed by the, mm. uh, everyone that was uh, sur surely behind her, uh, sorry, him in the market, but Brighter Days Ahead perhaps was just too good and authoritative in the end. She was, to look at visually, <laughs> it was a terrific performance. Yeah, and she'll jump a fence, like she's yeah. a different shape to Apple Shade. she was a small kind of compact mare. She'd, I would love them to do what they did with Shattered Love. Like, I know the mayor's campaign has obviously mm, yeah. then changed in recent years, but she won the JLT, which is now the Turners, ran in a gold cup and a Ryanair and finished off in the Grand National. Like, her, the framework that she's got, she should be jumping a fence and owned by Gigginstown. You'd imagine she probably will. Yeah, Gordon said that. I think, um, uh, I think she travelled strongly in this race, but she wasn't keen. And there is a difference between the two. She was keen at Cheltenham and Jack Kennedy didn't know what to do for the best. I, like you, would question the form. Staffordshire mm. not, obviously. I think he's a really smart horse going forward. But she did beat a 20-to-1 shot and a 51 shot. And the two Willie Mullins horses did underperform. So there is question marks around that. But yeah. she has the potential to go right to the very top. Yeah, and I think fences might be the plan for her next yeah. year. So very, or next season. So very exciting. Uh, the Liverpool Hurdle, strong leader. Uh, I thought <laughs> as a, a staying hurdles or a performance in a staying hurdle, as impressive as we've seen this season? Yeah, it, I couldn't have had him at all, looking back at his form after with the race yeah. either. Um, but yeah, I, it was really good for Ollie Murphy. He got real buzz out of that. Obviously, a, a second grade one win, four-year wait yeah. um, for him to have a second grade one victory. Um, I felt a bit bad for Jack Gilligan. He was forced to go for home on Buddy One a bit early, kind of just got left there. And yeah. I saw a few things on Twitter were saying, oh, he went too early. But he didn't really have a choice. He'll, he's apparently going novice chasing next season. He's, I yeah, like him. He, he's yeah. good. Um, Flora and Porter faded late on. Probably Cheltenham left a, left uh, an effect on him. Um, Hidden Valley Lake was probably too keen in third over that three miles. Um, I imagine he'd go back novice chasing. Obviously, had that blip last season and went back hurdling. Um, What's happened to Crambo? I know. Yeah. Really disappointing. Extraordinary. Yeah. The two runs at Aintree and Cheltenham have been very disappointing. Not sure. 
Um, how good a strong leader? Is he uh, a viable stairs hurdle? Oh, yeah. He had, I mean, when you look back on his form, as Steve said, it's tricky, but he, you can kind of uh, get a little portfolio. He had enough speed to only be beaten 12 lengths in the Supreme. Mm. He then came to Aintree and finished second at Aintree in a top novice. And then if you watch his races again, and they've made the decision to avoid Cheltenham, the, the festival, that is. They didn't avoid the cleave. Now, watch, if you have the facility, please watch the cleave again and see where strong leader is three out. <laughs> mm. uh, that was, for me, the run of a true star because he was even behind Paisley Park and that takes some doing to reduce the deficit. Um, you saw what it meant to Ollie Murphy at Aintree afterwards. It was, um, and perhaps it was the run in the cleave that made the decision to come straight to Aintree in this very category and he potentially uh, be a major contender at, in the stayers next year. That's if they decide to go. However, I sense that Ollie said, we know where we're going next year, so it will be back here again. 16 to 1 for the stairs if they did yeah. end up in that race uh, with Bet365. One more performance from Saturday <coughs> at Aintree to look back on. Uh, Founder 50, I thought was going to win a lot easier. Yes. Between the, from the second to yeah. last down to the last. Made a little bit of a mistake at the last. Gets back up to beat a brave Master Chewy, though. Is, where, where do you see the future for those two horses? Um, they will be doing battle... What we've got to remember going into that race, there was like a, a downpour as well. Uh, the ground may have changed to some respect. The pace with the race was different. He'd been second to, sorry, he'd been behind Gaelic Warrior and Ilaya Tomp uh, had found a 50. He's had seven grade ones and one two. So he's like a bit of a movable feast, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. Um, and maybe it's the end of a busy season for both of them and now they can sit back the pair of them uh, Nigel Tristan Davis and indeed um, obviously Gordon and think where are we going to go with founder 50 now mm. it's a very hard decision to know where they're going to go because they know what's sat going in their same avenue do they think they're going to improve yeah. or do they try and drop down or go up or do they just avoid Cheltenham altogether yeah <laughs> how good a performance do you think that was and where does the future lie for Founder 50? I mean, he's 25 to 1 with Bet365 for the champion chase. I wouldn't yeah. be in a huge rush to take that, if I'm being honest. All of this did for me was just further enhance how good Gaelic Warrior was. Yeah. Um, he beat them eight and a half lengths in the Arkle yeah. on yeah. the bridle. It kind of says it all, really. Um, anything else from Aintree that you both Chango want to mention? Bay. Django Bay. Go. <laughs> Django Bay. Uh, I want to give full credit an acknowledgement to Katira. I yeah. really do. Um, because uh, things happen in racing, incidents happen, but for Django Bay, it just didn't happen. Mm. The, the, when the gap was there, it wasn't there because um, the opportunity closed right in its face. And then uh, you had no choice and Django Bay reduced that deficit to Katira. It, and it just showed mm. you then how good the Nikki, how well the Nicky Henderson horses were coming back. And I thought we just give a shout out to to Jago Bay who ran it with credit there. But take nothing away from Katira because yeah. that crossed the line in front, and opportunities do open and close during racing. He likes entry, Jango he Bay. He does. Um, anything else you want to mention? Just quickly three, yeah. mainly for the jockey part of it. I thought Derek O'Connor was brilliant on it's on the line. Yeah. Um, yep. In the Fox yeah. Hunters, he's a tricky customer and needs a lot of encouragement from the saddle. But I just think the seven-year-old kind of got the, the older legs. He beat 13-year-old Benny's King and 11-year-old yeah. Animix. But I thought Derek O'Connor, once again, was fantastic in the saddle. I thought Bryony was brilliant on Sombre, um in the red rum. She's just brilliant on a front runner. He won that from two pounds out of the handicap. Um, yeah, Samoir finished second once again. But I thought that, yeah, the ride that Bryony gave him was absolutely fab. And then Ben Smith winning on El Jefe oh, was brilliant. just brilliant. I mean, he, to put this into perspective, he took out his licence in December. <laughs> this was his first outside ride yeah. out of his dad's stable. It, it, brilliant interview with Lydia. It's well worth going back and trying to find it. Um, Go Dante obviously was the unlucky loser from that. Mm. It was, yeah, reluctant to start and, and, and used a lot of energy to get into it. But, yeah, Ben Smith, Bryony Frost and, um, and Derek O'Connor. 
Okay, I'll just add uh, the Stuart Edmonds team and Arizona Cardinal. Nice. Um, after those couple of pulled up performances, looked as if the season was going downhill, but credit to the team to bring him back. Uh, and a big day, probably one of the biggest for the uh, Stuart Edmonds team. So that's a look back at uh, the best of the action from Aintree. Okay, before we get into our weekend preview, just to let you know that our sponsor, Bet365, have an ITV Racing price promise. They will not be beaten on price on any horse for all UK and Irish races shown live on ITV Racing. Full T's and C's can be found on the website. Uh, and now to air this weekend, potentially a couple of big fields to line up for the Scottish Grand National, the Scottish Champion Hurdle. Let's deal with the Scottish Grand National. At the moment, Willie Mullins has the favourite, second favourite. Uh, McDermott, 11-2, Mr. Incredible, 7-1. Anglers Crag, 8-1. Gitmaker, 11. Sail Away, 12. Stay Away, Faye, 12s, 14s, bar those. Tanya, go. What's going to win? Great race. Um, so much so, I love air. I'm actually going to be there, so I'm going to give them all a cheer on. What's going to win? You need to be potentially under 11 stone, which you can see. Carry under 11 stone, you need to be in form. Recent winners, we see winning my wings and Kitty's Light have gone by the Ida. That's why Angler's Crag is towards the fore. And also it helps to be up there mm. from the start. You get into your rhythm at air. Uh, also, Let's hope that the rain doesn't scupper. It's soft at the moment. Looking at the charts we have, it doesn't look yeah. as though it's going to get any worse than soft. There's a bit of rain coming. So with that in mind, you expect Mr. Van Gogh, if it does declare, do exactly the same thing that it did in Cheltenham, which will help the race, go out in front, set a really good tempo. And I'm going for a horse that potentially morally might have won at Cheltenham, but actually came second, because when you see how far behind the third was, um, Will Biddick uh, rode it brilliantly. It's a horse called Gitmaker who uh, went into Cheltenham and ran really well, but mm. unfortunately came across a superstar in its race. I like Gitmaker. I have to give uh, a shout out to Mr. Vanger because I think that will lead for most of the way, and it would be very hard if it completes to push it out the first four or five because there'll be um, place uh, concessions, so you'll yeah. get the, the pace right, right on that. My silver lining will be there or thereabouts again, because it's shown throughout the season if you go through those stay and chases, but get maker the way that that ran at, at Cheltenham. I don't think it took too much mm. out of it either. It's come in here with a, a superb profile for this and ran excellently at Cheltenham. So Jamie Snowden could be... Uh, uh, in there maybe, spoiling the Tony's Championship party yeah. and that prize money yeah. base, yeah. Well, you mentioned Willie Mullins as a favourite, McDermott, yeah. who's six years old. Yeah. As far as I can tell, I only one six-year-old yeah. has, has won the race, and I think that was Earth Summit, um, yeah. who obviously yeah. was a pretty special horse anyway, because he, of course, won the national as well. Um, do you agree, Gitmaker? Is there something alternative? Are you going with the Willie Mullins team? No, I think the Willie Mullins runners will be overbet in this. I'd be against them. I don't particularly like their profiles for the race. Gitmaker was the one for me as well. Tarns has kind of said everything you need to. Finished 18 lengths clear of the third. When second behind, I know the way you're thinking is only up a pound. I think mm. if the handicapper has another look at that, you might think that one pound rise is a bit lenient in hindsight with, I know the way you're thinking, winning the grade one at Aintree. So, yeah, 11 to 1 standout with bet 365. Okay, uh, I've mentioned two that I'll be backing. Beauport and My Silver Lining have, of course, bumped into yeah. each other at Utox. My Silver Lining, just because I've got a soft spot for her. I mean, she's a lovely horse. Um, probably the last two runs she's been in front soon enough, mm -hmm. um, but she does that because she travels and jumps so well. But Beauport, remember when he won that Colin Parker yeah. two years ago? Yes. He looked a real star. Yeah. And at the time, he was rated 148. Obviously, he's come down, things have been... Uh, I must admit, two starts back, you're thinking Beauport's finished, but then he comes to life like he did in the uh, Midlands Grand National and suddenly looks like a different horse. So um, hopefully, I mean, he's back up to the old 148 mark. So those are the two horses I'll be backing at around 16 to 1, bet 365. The Scottish champion hurdle, uh, Lerda Sud is the 3 to 1 favourite, Doddy the Great Sixes, Iberica Lord, Eights, see both from the Henderson uh, Stable, Favour and Fortune, Bialystok, Rubo. Um, how do you see this one? I really like Favour and Fortune in this at 9-1. to one. Um, I think he has the right profile for all these big handicap hurdles being an unexposed novice. And the form has received a few boosts mm. at Aintree. Tarns has kind of touched on, on Django Bay and how unlucky he was. He finished second behind Django Bay in that Grade 1 Formby. Novice's hurdle at uh, Boxing Day at Aintree. Um, he's obviously Django Bay's finished second in the Mall Battle and, and at Aintree behind Katira. I then finished second behind Fun 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 at Exeter. Was a, 
a bit inconvenienced by the three-runner race that day. Yeah, I thought he okay. it wasn't yeah. given a great ride either. And I thought he was the eye-catch of the race in the Supreme. Finished sixth, didn't jump as well as he could do. Obviously, Mystical Power and Firefox have both fought out the finish at Aintree. Uh, a mark of 138 seems perfectly fair. And yeah, 9 to 1 with Bet365. I'm, I'm keen on Favour and Fortune. Strong claims for Favour and Fortune. What about you, Tanya? Low said will be very sure, but they must be thinking, what have we got to do to win a handicap <laughs> virtual? Yeah. Because they went yeah. for Glory, uh, Newbury, uh, scuppered there, um, and then they went for Glory at Cheltenham, scuppered there. Very, very short, though, very short. Mm. And uh, I am thinking, if only I didn't go to Cheltenham with Doddy the Great, I really am. Yeah. I mean, I, after that... Uh, where Doddy the Great finished second, I was typing away. You've got to be Doddy the Great, Scottish champion hurdle. Um, and then it ran that Newbury race, and I'm thinking, lovely. Get straight up to New um, Air you go after the uh, uh, running behind Lowsard. But unfortunately, it's run since. And even so, uh, Nicky, Nicky's got a good record in the Scottish champion hurdle. And obviously, Lowsard is short now. Doddy the Great at air, how much will that be backed mm. because of the story behind it, because of the name? So if you like Doddy the Great, potentially now um, get on that. Another horse may be the Calico, who's run some really good uh, yeah, races over to one. chase fences and then dropped down. A bit like JJ Riley, same colours as that, yeah. same kind of scheme. I thought that Calico might, uh, it did go to... Uh, Cheltenham and run really well in one of the handicap hurdles. May he, I thought he might have even gone to Newbury and run instead of Low Sud, but it didn't. So I am going to go Doddy the Great as a selection, but a saver on Calico. Calico. Now, should it declare, and of course there's major importance, should it declare, it'll be more prize money, won't it? Of course. Mm, yeah. uh, Doddy the Great, 6 to 1, Calico, 25 to 1, bet 365. I'll, yes. I'll be backing Affadil again to do what he did last year. He actually ran at Cheltenham and Aintree last season. And then won uh, the Scottish Champion Hurdle last year. He's run two really good races at Cheltenham and Aintree again. Uh, although he's going to be higher in the handicap, I, I still don't think we've quite seen the best of that horse for whatever reason. He gives the impression he's even better at a track like Air as well. So I'll be backing him at 16 to 1. Um, is there anything else running around that in the next week or so that... Yeah, so, so one to... really caught my eye at air on on Saturday in the novice champion handicap chase. Now this this is a stipulation. Don't back at anti post. It's twenty five to one. It's Arctic Row, purely because he'll be miles out of the handicap if stay away Faye is declared. Right. I mm. assume he'll run in the Scottish Champion hurdle, but he's rated one hundred and fifty eight stay away Faye. <laughs> Arctic Row is only rated one hundred and sixteen to so be miles out of the handicap. But I don't think stay away Faye will run. But he's four from four at air in handicap chases. Um, okay. So he's got brilliant course form and he's only nine pounds higher than his latest win when he won by four and a half lengths. So Arctic Row is currently 25 to one, but yeah. wait until you see how far out the handicap he is. That's the 150 on Saturday. Um, new market on Thursday. Yeah. I just want to give a couple there. In the Wood Ditton, the one that really took my eye was Padesha. Now it's an ammo racing horse. It cost 300 grand um, as a yearling by Wooten Bassett. The thing that really caught my eye is that he was the one remaining entry in the Craven that hadn't ran, was in the race up to a really late stage, was 66 to 1 at that stage. But he's entered in the Irish 2000 Guineas, the Dante, the Derby, the Irish Derby, and they've decided to go for the Wood Ditton. I think he is going to be working really well at home. Um, so Padesha in the, in the Wood Ditton. And then later on the card in the 445, the novice race, Endless Victory, is the choice of William Buick. He had the choice between him and Calidesa who's the 2.8 million guineas Frankel out of So Me Da. Mm. They both won at Wolverhampton, but Endless Victory um, was really well backed that day against the stablemate, one by four and three quarter lengths. We'd have to concede a penalty, but so does the stablemate. So two for Thursday would be Endless Victory and Padesha. Interesting. Uh, without giving your best bet away, Tant, is there something else that... Yeah, interestingly, at air on the Saturday, I see John McConnell's got Anna Bonina running again, mm. but Anna Bonina's won a Scottish champion hurdle. Uh, should he declare she'll carry top weights in the mayor's hurdle, which she can capably do because yeah. she was really inconvenienced at Musselburgh last time she ran because I'd backed her and pa Park uh, Anna Siad and I watched the pair of them run and bump into one another, but they were in close proximity. So this is her 
meeting because she's finished second in the Scottish Champion Hurdle as well as winning it. So that's what I'll be looking out for her. And then Henry Candy's got his horses running yeah. really, really well at the moment. Um, at this time of the year, and he's got run to uh, was it yeah from run to freedom in the Abernant, and he particularly goes well with his sprinters. Uh, mm -hmm. Run to freedom comes there with a little bit of uh, prowess and strength and robustness. So the way that they ran at Windsor on Monday, his runners they ran really out of their skin. Yeah. So run to freedom if he's working as well yeah. as they did. Happy. If only Tiger Bay could have run a no, little bit better at Windsor, <laughs> that would have been a good start to the week. Uh, regardless, um, yes. two that I'm going to mention at Newbury on Saturday in the Fred Darling. There's a filly called El Malka running. Uh, James Doyle and Roger Varian. I think James Doyle could have a very good day on Saturday. Yeah. Um, El Malka's by Kingman out of Narain. She's only run once on the All Weather at Southall, but she was pretty green yet still quite impressive. That pedigree obviously related to Ben Battle amongst other good horses, screams talent. And she, I think in a weakish looking Fred, I don't think there's anything to be hugely concerned about in that race. I thought she's very interesting. And in the Greenham, a uh, horse that we know quite well, Valley Mount Boy, mm. it, everything about him screamed that he was going to be better at three than he was at two. He's a big, strong, lengthy horse. He managed to win last season at the back end of uh, the season, having run disappointingly in France. But I think there may have been excuses for that. Um, and James Doyle booked to ride Valley Mount Boy, who's racing in the Wathnan colours. So I'll be looking out for those two at Newbury on Saturday. Before we get into our best bets of the weekend, just to let you know of a free-to-play six horses challenge. It's available every weekend with prize pools available for five and four correct predictions, as well as a jackpot for all six T's and C's apply. Now it's time to put Tanya and Steve in the spotlight for their best bets of the weekend. Tanya, who's your best bet? Week. Oh, I'm going straight into the Scottish Grand National. Okay. Why not? I mean, I'm there. I'll be giving it a massive cheer. So I'm going to go for Gip Maker, who ran superbly well at Cheltenham, set it up self brilliantly. There'll be a great tempo up front, hopefully with uh, my silver lining and Mr Van Gogh. The pair of those will be hard to get out the frame. But Gip Maker should be in a lovely rhythm, fingers tightly crossed, like Will Biddick rode it at Cheltenham. I suppose it'll be Gavin Sheehan. Um, mm. here at uh, Air. We, whoever it is, good luck to them. I'm with Git Maker. Git Maker in the Scottish National for Tanya. Steve? We could have a nice double at Air on Saturday because <laughs> mine is going to be in the Scottish Champion Hurdle and it's Favour and Fortune at 9-1. to one. Um, just, I think he has the right, hand, uh, the right profile for this um, in handicap hurdles. He was thought well enough to, to run in the Champion Bumper as a younger mm. horse. Won a couple of low-key novice hurdles, then finished second behind Django Bay in the grade one Formby. Novices hurdle at Aintree on Boxing Day. The form of that has obviously worked out well. Django Bay went on to finish second in the Moor battle and second behind Katira, unlucky at Aintree uh, earlier this week. Finished second behind Fun Fun Fun. I don't think that race was ran to suit at Exeter. And then was the eye catcher when finishing sixth in the Supreme. On both occasions, his jumping kind of let him down a bit that day. And the Supreme has obviously had a form boost with Mystical Power and Fight Firefox. Fighting out the finish at Aintree. Mark 138 seems very fair. And 9 to 1 with Bet365 will do for me. Brilliant. Favour and fortune in the Scottish Champion Hurdle for Steve and Gitmaker in the Scottish National for Tanya. Thank you both uh, for your company on the show. It's been enjoyable as always. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Racing Weekly, brought to you by Odds Checker in association with Bet365. As always, if you've liked what you've heard or seen on this or any of our previous uh, podcasts, then please leave us uh, a kind review on the Apple Podcasts or in the comment section on YouTube. Next week, we'll be back. Uh, Paul Ferguson is going to join the team to have a look ahead for this season finale uh, at Sandan. But for now, from the Racing Weekly team, it's bye-bye. <laughs>